Welcome to the Redhead Reveal podcast. I am Jen Pinkerton, your Redhead host, a psychotherapist, high performance coach, writer, and speaker. As a connection expert, I help people reveal their connectedness within relationships, transforming from the root causes of beliefs and behaviors that hold them back from thriving in life. Let's talk about how you're thriving. Okay, I'm excited today that I have Amy Morin on the show, and this she is a best-selling author of 13 Things Mentally Strong People Do, 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Do, and then there's also 13 Things Mentally Strong Couples Do and Strong Women Do. I mean, the this whole focus you have and the way you've drafted and written these books with these exacting ways of... I feel like you you took a big, big principle, a big, big concept, and you narrowed it down in a way that was so palatable and and so easy to apply to life. And so I'm a huge fan, and I love to have you on here and tell us all about it. Thank you. I appreciate it. I love to talk about mental strength, and especially uh, when it comes to my books, I love to talk about what not to do. <laughs> Absolutely. I love to quote that you had, and I want to start off with this, is that you said mental strength is not the same thing as mental health. And that some of the strongest people battle mental health issues. Yeah. As a therapist, I would have so many people come into my office and say stuff like, well, if I just didn't have depression, then I could be mentally strong or I can't be mentally strong because I have an anxiety disorder. But what they didn't realize is mental health and mental strength are two very different things. Mm -hmm. And it makes more sense to us when we talk about it in terms of physical health and physical strength. Like, yes, you can go to the gym and you can become physically strong. And that doesn't guarantee you wouldn't ever get a health issue. Like you might still have high cholesterol or you might be battling high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And that's not a sign of weakness. And mental strength and mental health is the same. We all have the opportunity every single day to build mental strength. And people who are battling a mental health issue have some complicating factors. It makes it more difficult to do a lot of these things. So that's why I say some of the strongest people I've ever met were battling mental health issues. And I think that normalizes it so much because... A lot of people believe, I think, that there's still that stigma surrounding mental health. And to be able to to explain that they are two different things in that. And you can be so strong and do all these things in your life to really try to position yourself. Um, but, but we can't avoid dealing with the things we're going to deal with emotionally and mentally. And books like yours, I think, also give a concept of, hey, this might not be as hard as you think it is. You can actually apply some specific things in a specific way that you're going to see an improvement. You're going to witness a transformation that might propel you to continue to do more. That's just it. Sometimes a very small change can make a huge difference in our lives. People who say, I just started implementing a gratitude practice or I started journaling. And it might only be something like that that takes 10 minutes of your time But it's an investment. You have to try it. You aren't going to feel miraculously better the first time you do these things. But if you invest 10 minutes a day into trying something new and saying, I'm going to experiment with this strategy for a while, you might find that over the course of a couple of weeks, you start to feel better. People will say, I sleep better. I feel happy. I'm more optimistic. My brain isn't automatically going to the negative anymore. Mm -hmm. And And it's subtle changes. So you have to be on the lookout because sometimes a month or two later, somebody will tell me like, I'm not sure I've seen any differences. And we'll say, well, let's look at that. And we'll look for very concrete signs that somebody has made progress, but it's happened so incrementally that it's tough to notice on a day-to-day basis. I like that you said investment. I often tell clients, especially people that I know are maybe in jobs or careers that are very focused. I, I say things like, you know, do you invest money? Or do you invest in your finances in any way, shape, or form? Well, of course, most people say yes. Okay, but then why can't you invest in something that's also good for you, not just your bank account? Why can't you spend the same amount of time? Because you had to actually learn someplace how to invest your money. You had to learn how to manage your money. You had to learn what was going to be the most beneficial for you. Okay, well, that same time and energy investment can apply in this way too. And, and I think that that concept allows people to maybe almost gives permission that, okay, wait a minute, that's right. I should probably put my time towards this. That's just it. There's so much pressure right now to be productive and people feel like I have to always be churning something out or doing something. And they'll say, you know, when I sit down and write in a journal, I feel like that's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And so we have those conversations as well. How do you invest your time? And yes, maybe some of these strategies aren't going to be incredibly fruitful for you. And that's okay. You can switch strategies down the road. You can 
test out a whole bunch of different tools and coping skills and exercises and decide which ones you're going to keep over the long term. Just like if you had a toolbox of tools, you might reach for the the hammer and the screwdriver more often than you reach for the wrench. Our mental health tools are much the same. There's going to be certain ones that you reach for that become your go-to strategies, and, and that's okay. But until you experiment with a bunch of them, you won't really know which ones work the best for you. Mm -hmm. So what propelled you to write these books? What was the start? Yeah, I was a therapist. Uh, I got my degree and started uh, as a therapist in rural Maine. And my mom passed away about a year into my journey. And it was like a huge unexpected loss in my life. My mom had been very close to me, but I was only 23. And then three years to the day that my mom died, my 26-year-old husband died. And Similarly to the way I'd lost my mom, he died of a heart attack. So it was mm. sudden and unexpected. And I didn't even know that people could have a heart attack at age 26. And a few years after that, my father-in-law was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And it was like my 20s were just one loss after another. And I just couldn't even imagine like what life was going to be like without some of my favorite people in it. And I'm supposed to be a therapist who helps other people deal with their problems. So the thought of like, how how do I do this? And I'm supposed to also, as a therapist, like, gosh, Amy, I should have the tools and the resources to get through loss and grief. But I felt like a lot of the things I'd been taught actually weren't all that adequate. They really didn't even prepare me for the experience of going through incredible hardship or the physical pain that comes with grief. And so on one of my darkest days, I wrote a list of what mentally strong people don't do. It was the things I'd learned over the years that people just who didn't have these certain bad habits seemed to get better faster than the other people that came into my office. So I found the letter helpful. I put it on the internet, hoping a few people would read it. But 50 million people read the list and that launched my career as an author. I got to write a book and now uh, 10 years later, it's been six books. And I still get to speak about mental strength and the things that I learned in my personal journey, but also in my therapy office and the, the things I just learned about human nature and how sometimes on our darkest days, I know the last thing I wanted was a long to-do list of, Amy, you should be doing these 50 things today if you want to get through it. I just wanted a list of what not to do. And for me, that felt a lot more doable and pal palatable in life when life already feels overwhelming. If I could just avoid bad habits, uh, that felt like something I could do. What an amazing start. 50 million people. Amy, that's just wild. Right. I know. I was a therapist in rural Maine where, you know, I spoke to one person at a time. And uh, <laughs> the thought of then people all over the planet reading that list is unfathomable, really. So which one was the first book out of all these? So the 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't okay. Do was okay. the first book. And it was okay. uh, expanded on the article. And then a lot of people kept asking me about kids. So that's why I wrote the parenting book and then a book for women and then a kid's book in itself. And I've gone on to write a couple's book as well and a workbook. And it's been great because my audience kind of asks me like, how does this work for the specific population? So I'm thrilled so many people are interested in learning more about mental strength. Well, I think it's definitely a go-to because I love the simplistic nature of it as you're talking about, because it. I think so much of that overwhelm really is a thing that affects everybody. And I, sometimes even people come into therapy, that's too much of an overwhelm. And right. so I love anytime I see a book or read a book that I feel like gives people their own tool set to feel as though, you know, they can actually make a significant change in their life. Exactly. And just something that just, yeah, as you say, it feels so overwhelming when we think, my life just keeps getting worse every day. There's nothing I can do. You feel like everything's crumbling around you. And you don't know which way is up or which way is down or how to even take a step. And you doubt your ability that you have the energy and the motivation and the uh, will to, to make anything good happen. It's tough to be in that space. And for you to have suffered so much loss and be able to then, you know, use that in a way to help other people. I love that altruism in you. And I love that path that you've taken. Oh, thank you. That's great. So tell me, you know, how did you tailor this specific approach you use to help individuals identify these behaviors, kind of get an idea of what's robbing them or holding them back? Yeah, if you were to say the, the list of the 13 things mentally strong people don't do, it's things that we all do sometimes. Like number one on the list is don't feel sorry for yourself. Who among us hasn't done that? And we all do that. In, in, <laughs> right. And But to then know that the more we dig in our heels with self-pity, the longer we are going to get stuck. 
and that it's okay to be sad. And I wanted to educate people on the difference between sadness and self-pity, that sadness is a normal, healthy emotion. But self-pity is when you dig in your heels and you start to compare your life to other people and insist that yours is way worse and your problems are too big to be solved. And that it's that that keeps us stuck. It's not the universe holding us back or anything like that. It's just our mindset. So when I walk people through the 13 things, it's all about changing that mindset. How do you focus on what you can control instead of trying to focus on everything else? Or how do we give up the idea that we have to uh, to always be in charge of everything going on and the the things that happen when we do that? Or how do we not beat ourselves up for failure to the extent that we don't try again. So I wanted people to really know that these are all universal things we experience, but we have choices in how we respond to them. I really love that answer. So have you observed like a specific common pitfall or challenge that people run into over and over again? Yeah. The one that people tend to talk about the most from the first book is um, when I talk about mentally strong people don't give away their power. Mm -hmm. And this one is really about our language and how we'll often say things like, my boss makes me feel bad about myself. Mm. Or we might say, my my friend wastes my time or my sister ruined my day. And we're really implying that all of these other people have control over how we think, how we feel, how we behave. And it's really a sign that I need to set a boundary in my life. And that might be I'm going to end a conversation, I'm going to walk away, or I'm going to still choose to feel okay about myself, even if somebody had some harsh words, or I don't have to let somebody else's mood drag me down. Here's what I'm going to do about it. But time and time again, when I am giving speeches, or when I'm uh, doing a workshop, people will come up to me afterward and say, this is the one I battle the most. And I'll say, even after 10 years, like I'll find myself in those moments still sometimes still trying to do that as well, where I want to be like, well, if I hadn't had that conversation, then I'd feel better. Or or if this person hadn't done that, no, I can't control what other people do. It's just a sign again that I can set a boundary moving forward. I recorded a reel actually this morning. This is so funny about, you know, don't give away your power to somebody to say they made me mad. Yeah. So often you say they made me so mad. Okay, well, did they or did you choose that you let it bother you to the point to get so mad? I think that when we harness our own level of power and our own level of control over our lives, we start to look at the world very differently. And I think that's a lot about what your books do is you read through these and you understand these lists of things. You end up at the end going, wait a minute, I have a choice in all this. I have the ability to make specific, you know, patterns of behaviors and actions and basically get rid of these self-limiting beliefs. And my world could actually feel very different, look very different, and I could have a very different outcome. If you take that example, too, of that language, when we say somebody made me mad, mm -hmm. most people use that language. In fact, it's often encouraged to use that, like tell your sister she made you mad mm -hmm. and use your words. But that subtle difference in then empowering ourselves to say, okay, well, I have control over how I feel and how I respond to this person. It's just one of those shining examples of a small step we can make, changing our language. And then it does chip away at those beliefs when you think, oh, I, I'm not in control of myself or the world or all these bad things keep happening to me. Something as small as just changing your language to stop blaming other people for making you feel a certain way goes a long way toward empowering you to say, it's up to me to decide what kind of day I'm going to have. I mean, I particularly, even personally, feel really big about that because I have noticed for me that if I allow myself to be so bothered by something, by a specific person, then everything else in life starts to feel too heavy. Everything else in life, it, it, it's a domino effect, like this avalanche that comes down versus if we start at the top being able to say, nobody has the power to throw us off kilter, then, then we don't, life doesn't look so heavy. Does that make sense? I, I feel like it's, it's something I experience and I battle with. And I notice every time, if I look around and I'm not feeling good, I can usually attribute it to, I, I let somebody get the best of me. And for what? Yes. That's on me. That's not on them. And it, to me, it makes complete sense, but it's so ingrained in our society. And sometimes I even hear it from other therapists who endorse the idea that somebody's going to make you feel a certain way. But I think it's so much more empowering to recognize like, okay, maybe this person said something and I found it hurtful, 
But what I do with that emotion is up to me. I don't have to fuel it and continue to let myself get angry and let it ruin my day. I can move on and go do something else. Exactly. And that to me is harnessing the inner power that we're born with. You know, that's what yes. we're going to be is to be it, that, that life is about us instead of walking around being bothered by so many other things and, and basically kind of falling off the track where we're supposed to be feeling good and happy about ourselves and experience a, a joyful life. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. So how do you help your clients like learn how to forgive themselves and to cultivate that type of self-compassion that we're talking about, that type of, of inner inherent power and knowledge? You know, how do you help them get there? So one way is to just talk about how do we talk to your friends? And if your friend called you up and said, gosh, I really messed up, even if it was something big, your friend says, I totally messed up. I hurt this other relationship. We'd probably be quite kind to them. Be like, it's okay. We all make mistakes. Here's what you can do. Yet when it comes to ourselves, sometimes we beat ourselves up so much. It might be like, oh, I said something awkward in that meeting, or I did something today and it's going to ruin my entire life. So sometimes we'll start there. Like, how would you talk to your friend? If your friend struggled with this issue, your friend made that mistake, what would you say? And then we talk about like, what would that mean if you didn't forgive yourself? I've worked with plenty of people, and I'm sure you have too, who feel like they deserve to be punished for something. And it might be a mistake that they made 10 years ago where they didn't weren't the best parent to their children. So now they still feel like they don't deserve happiness. So they keep punishing themselves or sabotaging themselves in some interesting ways. So we might talk about that. Like, okay, well, if you keep doing that, then what? At some point when you get to be 55, will you then say I've punished myself long enough? Or how does that work? Right. I mean, and you work at some place and, and how long are you going to carry it? Right. And then what would that mean if you let it go? If you said, okay, I don't have to beat myself up every day. Like, What's the fear behind that? Like, then I won't learn my lesson or then I won't, uh, I won't have really shown how sorry I am for this thing. So we talk about those, like the pros and cons of holding on to a fear versus the pros and cons of letting go of that belief and then figuring out, and what do you want to do? Like, yes, that's an option. You can be, choose to beat yourself up for this for the rest of your life if that's what you'd like to do. But if your goal is to put some goodness into the world or to leave the world a kinder place than you discovered it yourself, probably being really mean to yourself isn't going to get you there. And here's why. I agree with that completely. All these five books have this principle of that, you know, this concept of here's the things that you're that you're not going to do. Here's the things that if you focus on this and you and you decide, okay, I'm going to go through this list and make certain that I'm not employing all these in my day. But do you find that any people say, okay, well, what's left? Do they know how to then switch that, make that shift to say, okay, I'm not going to do those things, but now what? What, what am I supposed to do? How do you how do you handle that shift in that? Yeah, I try to make sure people are aware of the mindset. So if we took the one about not giving up after your first failure, so people know, okay, well, I'm not supposed to give up just because I failed, but what does that look like instead? Like, okay, how do I deal with that hurt, the rejection, or the feelings that I'm not good enough underneath? And then how much of that do I have to make sure I heal emotionally versus when do I take action? So sometimes we think, I can't do this again until I'm completely confident. Mm -hmm. But the truth is sometimes taking a step forward is how you gain confidence. So balancing that out, we really look at the thoughts, feelings, and behavior. And if you want to change how you feel, you can change how you think and you can change how you behave. And those are really the, the remedies. So if somebody says, you know, I'm feeling this way and I don't want to feel that way anymore, then we take a look at well, what are the thoughts perhaps that are fueling that emotion and what are the behaviors and what are your options moving forward? How could you think about it differently and what could you do differently perhaps to shift how you feel? I agree with that. That sounds great. So out of these books, why don't you give me one, give our audience, our viewers, one of the 13 things from each book so that everybody can get a teaser of kind of how that applies differently from couples, people, women, parents, and kids. Oh, sure. Okay. So okay. I guess we've talked about some of the 13 things mentally strong people don't do. Um, I'll give you one more would be that they don't repeat the same mistakes over and over again. again. From 13 things mentally strong parents don't do, uh, that parents don't take responsibility for all their kids' emotions. Mm, that's a big one. Right. And yeah. then uh, from 13 things mentally strong women don't do that. They don't overthink everything because we know that women sometimes overanalyzing, ruminating, getting mm -hmm. stuck in the moment. 
You got it. Mm -hmm. And then um, from 13 Things Strong Kids Do, that's my only book that's in the to do as opposed to don't do format. I talk about um, that mentally strong kids persevere. So mm -hmm. there's a chapter about that. And then in my couple's book, one would be that uh, mentally strong couples don't keep secrets from each other. Oh, secrets are so big. They I are. talk about the difference between privacy and secrecy all the time because yes. I think you're lost in translation often with that concept. What do you think about that? Yeah. And it gets a little complicated when it comes to, say, social media, right? For sure. People, people are like, well, you know, I don't want you to have my social media password, which is fine. You can keep that stuff private. But then for people to know, but then if in your DMs, you're having conversations with an ex or you're having, you're flirting with people, then it, that's a secret. So for couples to be having more of those open conversations, like what's your expectation? And especially speaking of social media in a world where it's so easy for exes and other people in your life to easily contact you at any given moment, how are you going to respond if that happens? What would your expectation be of what your partner would do? And how do we make sure that we're not harboring secrets that are going to really erode the trust in your relationship over the long term? You're so right, because I think about it often as low hanging fruit on social media. People will reach out and do things that they would never say in public. They would never right. say in, in real life. They would never come up to you on the street and go, hey, remember me? We went out on a date 20 years ago. I just thought I'd come say hi. They won't right. get in the car, drive down the street, come find you at work and come say that. But we go this low hanging fruit and then it's kind of like this easy access. And to me, if people would look at it that way, I wonder if people would then filter it down to say I, I, that's not that big of a deal. It was so easier for you to reach out to me Then obviously this really wasn't that big of a deal. Do you see, you see what I mean? It's like yeah. emphasize the importance of it or the the impact of it. It's a slippery slope, right? Somebody might say, oh, my ex started liking some of my photos. And then before they know it, they start just having a conversation about old times. And then then you think, oh, it'd be a little uncomfortable to talk to my partner about this now. So I just won't mention it. And it goes on for a long time. I on see that often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why was the kids book written in the positive instead of the negative? So my hope was if we raised kids to do certain things like that, they could learn how to how to persevere, that they could learn how to uh, have better social skills, how to have better coping skills. They won't grow up to do those bad habits that we do. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to teach them if you start implementing these things now, then you probably won't grow up to feel sorry for yourself or you won't grow up to be so afraid of failure like some of us are. Absolutely. What's next for you after all these books? Um, so I'm work I have a podcast called Mentally Stronger. So I'm working on my podcast and then just thinking about like what the next book is. And a big one people keep asking me about is business because when we're in the business realm, obviously it's a little different. You don't set a boundary with your boss, perhaps the same way do you do with your mother-in-law or the skills and schools that work at home might not always carry over into the office. So I'm hoping to write one about um, what to do in the workplace as well. Yeah, and I don't think you have the opportunity for the type of vulnerable conversations that we would encourage as a mother or a parent or a, or a wife or a you know any of that. I think that it's very different in that regard because there isn't that kind of space being held. Correct. Right. And do you trust your coworkers with private information? Most of the time, no. But yet at the same time, we know relationships at work have a huge impact on our happiness because we spend a lot more time with our coworkers than we do most of our friends and family these days. For sure. More time at work than anything else. It's got to be something that you find some joy and passion in as well because of that. Right. Exactly. So tell me about your podcast. Um, so my podcast is called Mentally Stronger with therapist Amy Morin. On Mondays, I have guests who are often authors. Sometimes they're experts, occasional celebrities, and they talk about uh, their mental health, what's helped them to grow mentally stronger in life, the lessons that they've learned. And on Fridays, I do a solo episode. It's called the Friday Fix Edition, where I share a quick mental strength strategy um, that people can apply right away so that they have a tool, usually stuff straight from my therapy office, but stuff that uh, anybody can apply Mm -hmm. right now, whether they just want to take their business to the next level or it's somebody who says, you know, I do battle depression and I just want to know one, as many tools as I can about how to manage my thinking or how to change my behavior. I'm going to have to tune into that. Thank you. So I want to go back to something that I earmarked, hold on, um, people pleasing. Mm. That was in the book in the um, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. 
I think people pleasing because it is one of the trauma responses. It is fawn. You know, it's it's one of the most common trauma responses that I think is so uh, very rarely viewed as a trauma response. And people don't recognize that that's so directly related to some sort of wound or experience that you had growing up and that's what shaped you. I want to go into those people pleasing signs that you had. And I would like for you to talk about people pleasing, because I think that's one of the one of the parts of this book that I really l- loved the most. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you brought that up, too, because for a lot of people, people pleasing started out as a survival skill mm-hmm. and they figured out if I can just try to make people happy, if I don't show my true self then somehow I'll get through this. But then it becomes a maladaptive skill later in life when you don't need to do it anymore. And then people it's a really deeply ingrained habit that's hard to get rid of once you've started doing it. Right. I think there's so much compassion that needs to be held there. Kind of a pat on the back. Wow, I learned how to cope. That's amazing. I did that. But now I'm an adult and I can shift into something different. Right. And for people who are people pleasers, sometimes they don't even notice it. I've had a lot of people that have read the chapter and said, I didn't think I was a people pleaser. And then I read the chapter and I thought, oh, I do some of those things. Maybe I say I don't have an opinion when I do, or I say yes to things I don't want to do, or I allow people to step on me in in various ways that I didn't know constituted making me a people pleaser. Well, let's test the waters right now. So for everybody listening, here's some questions or here's some, some aspects basically that you listed as signs. So you feel responsible for how other people feel. The thought of anyone being mad at you causes you to feel uncomfortable. You tend to be a pushover. You find it easier to agree with people rather than to express a contrary opinion. You go to great lengths to avoid conflict. You don't usually tell people when you're feeling offended or your feelings are hurt. You tend to say yes when people ask you for favors, even if you don't really want to do something. You change your behavior based on what you think other people want. You put a lot of energy into trying to impress people. And if you hosted a party and people didn't seem to be enjoying themselves, you'd feel responsible. I really liked that one. Um, You seek praise and approval from people in your life often. And when someone around you is upset, you take responsibility for trying to make him or her feel better. And you would never want anyone to think you're selfish. And you often feel overscheduled and overburdened by all the things you do. So how many of those for people that are listening resonate with you? And maybe you've never thought you were a people pleaser. Yeah, the one too about emotions and taking care of other people's feelings. Sometimes people thought, you know, for for years, I just thought I was compassionate or I was a highly sensitive person because I was so in tune with other people's emotions. But sometimes it's because people are just so uncomfortable with somebody else being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is people will think it's kindness is they'll say, you know, well, I'll forgo my own needs just to make sure somebody else is more comfortable But it often then goes back to people pleasing, the idea of if I don't make you comfortable, then I don't measure up. So therefore, I should abandon my own wants and needs in order to do what it is that you think that would make you happy. But the truth is, we don't even know what would make other people happy. Sometimes we do these things, we go above and beyond, and the other person doesn't even notice. And then we become disgruntled. Yeah. And and where did you first learn to betray yourself? When was the first yeah. time you learned how to say my needs don't matter and somebody else's needs are more important? That's a great question. It's a great way to to word that because it's true that sometimes in childhood or maybe in a first relationship in adulthood, we learned quickly, like I get praise if I don't do what I want to do or somehow I win favor with the other person. And although it's superficial, it feels really good in the moment. And then we think, so this is how you get by, or this is what love feels like, or this is how healthy relationships happen. I should sacrifice everything in order to make sure that your needs are met, even at the expense of my own. Well, it's back to those primary love lessons. That's the love lesson that you got when you were younger and it stuck with you. And now you're using it, but you're no longer a child. Right. It's time to shift into looking at life as an adult. Right. An adult. And it's tough to do that. It's tough to recognize, oh, some of those things I learned that have gotten me through life this far just right? aren't that helpful anymore. And then to actually dig deep and start making those changes is difficult. So there's another one. I'm going to switch over to the the parents book because there was one in there. I've got to find the beginning of it that I really like too. Um, it was about perfection. So I'm just trying to find, okay, about expecting perfection. So talk about perfection um, as far as parents and the expectations they have on children and what that does. 
Right. So it's easy to think, oh, my kid can, can get all A's or they should always remember their soccer cleats for the soccer game. And we forget that mistakes are really part of the process. And But I hear from so many parents who think if I let my guard down on what I expect from my child, then they'll expect basically nothing from themselves. So if I don't expect them to get straight A's, then everything's going to fall apart. And so parents believe that putting this pressure on their kids is somehow helpful. And a lot of parents feel pressure to prevent kids from making mistakes. So if your child forgets their soccer cleats, we rush them up to the field because you don't want your child to miss out on practice because then they can't play in the game this week and that would be horrible. And we don't give them the opportunity to make mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. And we know that natural consequences are some of life's best teachers. But if we always get in the way we're propping them up, expecting them to be perfect, and then making sure that they are, we interfere with that process. And we know from the research that when kids have parents who are expecting too much from them, one of two things happen. Either the kids put so much pressure on themselves that they develop these incredible anxiety disorders and really struggle because they can't match up to what parents expect, or they kind of throw in the towel and they become complete underachievers who say, I can't meet your unrealistic expectations, so I'm not going to try to do anything. And they, their grades really slip and they give up on trying to do sports or doing anything else because they just feel like they can't measure up, so they don't want to try. Well, and kids can only be pushed so far. You know, adults will take it longer. Adults will be pushed longer in different ways. But for kids, it, it's it's that pendulum is going to swing one, one of two ways. It's either going to be, I'm going to actually take everything my parents are telling me to be perfect. And that is what I am. That's what I have to be. And nothing else will be okay. Nothing else is acceptable. And then they suffer from that low self-worth you're talking about. They make um, bad decisions sometimes, which really goes to the core of feeling like they're not good enough. Or they throw in the towel, like you're saying, completely give up and and then maybe go on from adulthood to never feeling like they can do ever, anything. Maybe never having a stable job, maybe never having a successful relationship, always feeling as though, you know, they're behind the curveball. That's just it. And a lot of times when people feel like they have to be perfect, they develop some, some serious underlying issues from eating disorders to secret addictions because they're struggling to cope because they feel like I'm not good enough, yet they have to have this facade that they are good enough. And that's a really uncomfortable and difficult, if not impossible, place to be when you feel like my inside world just doesn't match up with what I'm expected to show people on the outside. And that disconnect causes some really difficult and unhealthy behavior in most people. I think so. And I see this so often from something as simple as my kid forgets his lunch all the time. And so I take it up every single day. Right. Okay. Right. Well, are you going to also make sure they wake up, make it to their job? Are you going to make sure that that they pay their rent when they're 30? I mean, you know, that that letting go concept, I think, is so hard for parents because so many parents have the best of intentions. They do. And the, the study that always gets me is when they ask first year college students if they were prepared for college. Like 90 percent of kids say academically, yes. Yet 60 percent of them say emotionally, no, I don't have this skills and tools and resources to deal with a an argument with my roommate or a failed test when my mom or dad aren't right there to help me or I don't know how to deal with the loneliness that often comes with college because we aren't giving them those opportunities to fail, to get rejected, to make a mistake when they're under our roofs. And those are the times when we should be practicing and teaching them the skills of, okay, this happened. How do you cope with it? So that when they do move out, they know, okay, I don't have to depend on mom or dad to be right there and tell me what to do. I know what to do. You know, as a parent of college age kids, among others, I've got blended family of four, but with two in college, I've, I've gone through quite a bit of this. And I've, I've been, you know, kind of grappling with the idea of I need to have some sort of course out there about getting kids prepared for college, because it is such a awakening, I think, when you when kids go to school and, and they don't understand what's required of them. And so many parents, myself included, you know, you, you do so much for your kids. And and I've had to really be really careful about that personally to try to not overdo, to try to make sure that I'm not helicoptering, to keep my distance, to let them fail, let them fall down right now while they can figure it out and learn how to trust their own instincts. And I think that the instinct part is the piece that's missing so much, you know, letting your kids develop their own instinct for things instead of just what would mom say I should do? What would dad say I should do? You know, or what did my brother do? You know, it's basically what is your own instinct? 
Yeah, I, I think a course like that is probably desperately needed. And I hope that you do make one. <laughs> I've worked with parents who will say, you know, I didn't let my kids like they've never crossed the street by themselves, literally. And now they're going to college. So yes. now what do I do <laughs> other than call them every day to make sure they're awake and monitor them? I'm tracking them on their phones. I'm calling them constantly. I'm you know, rushing meals to them while they're in college and doing all of these things because now I can't let them fall on their face. So what do I do? And then parents, you know, these are the parents that we know are now attending their kids' job interviews even after they graduate from college, which is a real problem these days. So it's tough. When do you start to back off? And if you haven't backed off in time, what do you do then? Well, and also if you haven't backed off, I think that there's so much more exploration that needs to be done of what are you not getting in your life that this is where mm -hmm. all your fulfillment is. Right, so exactly. That, that trickles over into something else, a whole nother conversation that's really important to have. Yeah, which is a good point. How many parents will say my entire world revolves around raising my kids and making sure that we're the ones who are doing the best at everything we do. And they even use the word we, like we have a we, soccer game yeah. tomorrow, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. instead of Sarah has a game or whatever. Exactly, you're right. right. Mm -hmm. right. So I want the next book to come out about the business aspect of that. I'm, I'm ready for that. So, you know, you need to get to writing, Amy, for sure. Okay, we'll we do. Need that too, <laughs> because I really love how concise um, the structure of these books are. And I recommend them to my clients. And I hope everybody will go in the show notes and click your links and be able to purchase, purchase these books, because I think they're of such a valuable resource. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, coming from another mental health professional, it's especially powerful. So thank you. Well, I really loved having you on today. It was an awesome conversation. Anything um, else you want to give us before I give you your guest question? I would just say that um, for people to know that most of us are stronger than we think. Your brain will underestimate you and tell you that you're not capable or not competent enough, but your brain lies to you. You don't have to believe everything you think. Instead, you can choose to prove your brain wrong sometimes when it tells you that you can't possibly handle a social rejection or that you shouldn't try something. You can go ahead and do it anyway. That's great. Absolutely. Don't listen to your brain all the time for sure. Right. All right. So guest question, what was left for you by the prior guest was, when was the first time that you felt like you were living your purpose? That's a great question. I think probably, probably when I started working as a therapist, I hadn't really set out to be a therapist. I was a pre-med student thinking I was going to uh, work with physical health. But when I started working with people in the mental health realm, I just absolutely felt at home and I felt like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And surely imagine in the moment that I'd be a 40 hour a week therapist, never intended to write a book or anything. But now that I've seen the way my life unfolded too, I think, wow, like I feel like it was meant to be. Like I'm so thankful I was a therapist when I went through these losses and so thankful that I got to write books and to be able to share this information. Um with the other people. So I do feel like that was my purpose and being able to help others. So yeah, I guess when I started at working as a therapist, I felt like, yeah, this is it. And that makes a lot of sense because I bet being a therapist while you were struggling so much and dealing with so much grief, that allowed you to be more introspective maybe than you wouldn't have been if you, if you weren't a therapist. I can't imagine how I would have gotten through all of that if I hadn't had just information on what PTSD is and I hadn't known about grief and some of the things um, while I felt like it wasn't enough, I felt like I was way better prepared and educated than I would have been if I had majored in accounting or something completely different. <laughs> exactly. All right. What kind of question would you like to leave for our next guest? Oh, that I would love to know what your next guest um, is now able to do now that they've developed the mental strength to do it. So what's one thing you can do now that you couldn't do before now that you have more mental strength? Oh, I love that one. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Amy. It's been a pleasure to meet you and have this conversation. And we're going to keep in touch. And I can't wait for that next book to come out. Oh, thank you so much. And I hope that your uh, course on college students comes out as well. <laughs> For sure. We'll be sharing. We'll, we'll swap some stories there with Excellent. that. Excellent. Sounds All good. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank thanks. you.